Hey everybody, Jeff from Corrugated Cavalier here with my next video on British beer of World War I and British swords of World War I. This one is about the 1915 Courage Double Stout and the 1908 Cavalry Sword. So let's get started. Um, if you haven't seen my video on the 1913 Adams BLB, and the infantry officers, the 1897 infantry officer sword, that video is right up here. So yeah, here we go. Um, so once again, this is the 1915 Courage Double Stout. A little bit about the Courage Brewery to start off with. So it was started by John Courage in 1787 in London. Uh, he unfortunately died just a few years later in 1793, leaving it to his wife Harriet, who unfortunately also died a few years later. Um, Mr. John Donaldson took it over. In 1797, renamed it to Courage and Donaldson, as one does. Um, and by 1888, it was registered, the brewery was registered as just Courage. Um, in 1903, the brewery began expanding, buying uh, other breweries, as well as their tied public houses. So if you're from the U.S. and you're not familiar, the, you know, you've, of course, heard the term, the term pub. That means public house. And uh, if you were a brewery in those days, you almost had to uh, either own public houses or um, get in with them so you could distribute your product, really. That was a means of distributing your product. Um, it gets a lot more complicated than that. I don't want to go into it because A, I don't want know enough about it, and B, kind of outside of the scope of this video. Okay, so about this specific beer, um, 1915 Courage Double Stout. It would have been available both bottled and on draft. Uh, it uses pale malt, brown malt, black malt, and invert number four. So in the other video on Adnam's BLB, I uh, mentioned that invert sugar was some kind of unrefined sugar that was boiled with a food grade acid to darken it and change the flavor. Potentially some other reasons as well. Um, the hops were Fuggles, Hallertau, which is a German hop, so consider that, think about that in World War I, and East Kent Goldings, um, which is kind of the standard English posh hop of the time. Um, I subbed the Fuggles for Challenger because I didn't have Fuggles, and it's once again, it's the bittering edition, just like in the... Uh, 1913 Adams BLB, and not really a lot of that flavor and aroma ends up coming through. The rest of the recipe was spot on. Um, the OG is 1.079, and the which is original gravity, and the final gravity on this is 1.033, which is actually very very high. 58% attenuation, which is basically how much of the available sugar was converted into alcohol, is quite low. And I'm not really sure why. The uh, A lot of factors come into play with that, mash temperature being one. Um, but the mash temperature was not super, super high on this. Um, and I'm wondering if it was just uh, because uh, they didn't have the modern malts. And with the use of so many dark malts, maybe they didn't really have... Uh, Maybe all the enzymes were killed off in that process back in those days, where it's not as much the case now. I'm honestly not really sure, to be perfectly honest. Um, because of that, however, mine attenuated quite a bit more, <laughs> and my OG was a little bit higher to start with anyways. So um, mine ended up being more like 7.5%, which is why I only have a small glass with me. <laughs> but you know, oh no, 7.5% stout, uh, I'm not going to complain too much. Um, so the interesting thing about the Hallertau hops uh, was, yeah, Germ they were at war with Germany and Hallertau was a German hop. However, most of the time the hops we were using were not from that harvest season. A lot of times they were a year or two, possibly even more old. So it's very possible that uh, they got those Hallertau hops from Germany before the war started. Um, okay, so that's about this particular beer. The tasting notes on this... First of all, this came out super well. This is one of the best, like, basic stouts, like, without any other crazy flavors or anything that I've ever brewed. So that first hit on the nose is definitely, like, before you taste it, this aroma is definitely like a good dark roast coffee or espresso. As you drink it, there is 
it's a little bit more like a good dark chocolate or possibly some dark fruit um maybe even just like a hint of cherry possibly i'm not really gonna go there it definitely does not taste like cherry but like like there's a there is like just a hint of fruitiness to go along with that kind of dark chocolate and kind of like roast coffee kind of thing going on um yeah this is it's it's really fantastic i'm not gonna go too too far into tasting notes because i don't want to sound too snobby <laughs> basically um okay so uh, soldiers were drinking this beer, or you know, my attempt at making this beer, presumably uh, on leave when they were when they were back home, and uh, it's kind of nice to transport myself back to that time in any little way that I can, because um, I you know don't want to actually go back to World War One. That sounds pretty awful. But let's talk about the 1908 Cavalry Sword, which is the that's my sword pairing for this beer, the 1908 Cavalry Sword. Okay, so I'm going to get out my Spurgeon trainer once again, just to kind of help illustrate. So um, the 1908 Cavalry Sword was a dedicated thrusting sword. There was not really any cutting ability whatsoever, unlike the uh, 1897 Infantry Officer Sword, which you could, depending on how you service, sharpened it. The 1908 Cavalry Sword is basically just a sharpened metal spike, like shortened lance almost. Um, there were some mi minor modifications in 1911 and 1912. British cavalrymen and uh, Commonwealth cavalry all used this throughout World War I. Um, since 1853, the British cavalry had been opting more for thrust capacity and the cavalry, the 1908 cavalry saber. So go look at some actual pictures of it. I'll put one up, but. 1908 cavalry saber was really made solely for thrusting. Um, the Britain was slow to standardize, apparently, to like a really specific level, um, and had sealed patterns in the early 20th century for the first time. And uh, this design was was one of the first, actually, apparently, like with super specific sealed patterns. Um, they had a special committee that formed in 1903. Uh, after failure of a previous model in the Second South African War. And this panel included distinguished cavalry officers, uh, Sir General Sir John French and Major General Douglas Haig. Uh, it is a narrow T-section blade, once again solely for thrusting. Uh, and this you can even tell this by the new manual in 1912 that says, each man should ride at his opponent at full speed with the fixed intention, uh, determination of running him through and killing him. And you can see this in uh, the exercises of the time. It was really just them pretending to be on a horse and being like, if it, you go through that way, then let the sword come out. <laughs> and if you go through this way, let the sword come out this way. Um, and Matt Easton has a good video on this as well. Um, so, you know, people think that the cavalry were not of much use, and as in the Western Front, as they dug into trench warfare, that's true. But in the early days of the war, that wasn't quite as true. And also in the Eastern theaters of uh, Syria and Palestine, there was a lot more cavalry action. But um, even in the Western Front, the first British kill of World War I was with this uh, 1908 cavalry sword by Captain Hornby of the 4th Dragoon Guards in a skirmish with the German 4th Cuirassiers. Uh, so the first British kill of World War, with blah, 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 World War I was with a cavalry sword. And uh, yeah, once it bogged down into trench warfare, sure, like traditional cavalry roles were not as uh, prevalent, but they did make first contact with the enemy quite often on like scouting uh, missions, etc., etc. And as I said, in the uh, eastern fronts of Syria and Palestine. Um, so that was the 1908 cavalry sword. Uh, I hope that was interesting along with the uh, pairing with the beer. I hope that you learned something today. Um, if you like this, please comment below, like, subscribe, all that stuff. Share it around with folks. Um, thank you for coming by the channel as always and uh, be good to each other. Cheers.